Well, let the people of God say amen. Come on, if you love the Lord, say amen again. If you're glad to be here tonight to worship God in spirit and in truth, say amen one more time. Amen to Pastor per to John Perkins and to all of you. We bless God for this evening and for all of you that are here. I know the time is far spent and I feel uh, in this moment uh, somewhat like a corpse at a wake. Um, and, and that is that you expect him to be there, but you don't want to hear too much from him. Uh, and so I'm, I'm clear, uh, and I am grateful uh, for this opportunity and to be a part of this great conference because we've gathered together to consider how it is that we carry out the gospel of Jesus Christ, not simply preaching the gospel, not simply speaking words, but doing the word. Uh, and I am grateful, and I'm also grateful... You know, I wasn't sure uh, what this was going to be. I have to admit ignorance. Um, I won't be ignorant anymore. I have to admit ignorance to the organization, not to John Perkins, but uh, to this organization. And all I heard was CDC. Uh, I was excited to come, but then sometime when you think CDC, then you think 501c3. Then you start thinking a bunch of executives sitting around the table. I got a chance to speak, and I said, well, let me throw on my suit, get ready. Uh, it's going to be stuffy. Uh, we're going to talk about grants and how to uh, move money. And I walked in here and I said, this is going to be worship. I said, now nah, I get excited about this and so I am grateful. I wonder if you just stand on your feet for just a few moments. I know you've been sitting for a while. And as we prepare to hear the word of God, I wonder if you just lift your voices with me. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, ha. Hallelujah. 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 Now, if you love God tonight, just say, Lord, we love you. Lord, we love you. Oh, Lord, we love you. Oh, Lord, we love you. Yes, Lord, we Come on, just lift your voice one more time. If you know God is good, Lord, we love you. Oh, Lord, we love you. Lord, we love you. Lord. one more time as you are worthy you are to receive the glory and the honor and the praise you worthy oh you are worthy oh yes you are you are worth. Hallelujah. You are worthy. You are worthy. We love you and we thank you, God. 
Thank you for these moments to come and to share your word. I thank you for my brothers and sisters from all around this country. People who are concerned about the kingdom. Not simply over yonder, but right now, here in the present manifestation. God, we thank you for these wonderful facilities and these wonderful rooms. But even as we experience them, we're mindful of those who are outside right now. We're mindful of those who need our help. And Lord, we know we've been picked up to go out. So God, we ask that you strengthen us even right now. Lord, I have studied, but I need your strength. I have prepared, but I need your power. I'm willing and I want to, but only you can make me able. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my Lord, thy will to see, open mine eyes and illumine me. Spirit divine, amen. Amen. Give your neighbor a hug and then have a seat. Amen. Amen. Give your neighbor a hug and then have a seat. Amen. 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 I heard that there were some seminarians in here, and so I want you to know that I am going to break a cardinal exegetical rule, and I'm going to read a passage of scripture from one pericope to preach about the other pericope, uh, but I hope to tie them together before we get to the end of this thing. And, and so I'd like to talk for us, to us for just a little while tonight, really in looking at two stories in the Bible that call us to consider our ministry. So I'm going to lift up a passage of scripture, actually one verse, because of the length of the text and the limitations of our time, from Luke, the eighth chapter. I just want to lift up that 22nd verse in Luke, the eighth chapter, the 22nd verse. It says, now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples and said unto them, let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. Let us go over onto the other side of the lake, and they launched forth. Now, those of you that are familiar with that passage of Scripture, you know that that's getting ready to go into the story about the storm on the sea, which then leads into the story of the healing of the man in the Gadarenes. And I really want to look at both of those stories, and I want to talk about a new mission for a new millennium. A new mission for a new millennium. I grew up in the Baptist church. I'm the pastor of a Baptist church, and I grew up in a traditional Baptist church, and I know what it means to be a missionary. You wear white, and you, every fifth Sunday, you have service. You know that's what you do, and you, and you raise money, and you send off, send your money to foreign missions, and you, you run a soup kitchen, uh, and you do a feeding program, and then you wear white, uh, and you take Fifth Sunday, and you have a guest preacher, and you have a morning worship service, and then you come back in the afternoon, and you have an offering plate for the preacher, and you have an offering plate for the church, and then you wear white, um, and then you collect money, and you have bake sales, and you have afternoon services, and you invite people to come to your church. And while, and while I... I I, I may sound as though I'm trying to be humorous. I, I loved those old ladies in our church. I loved Fifth Sundays at church. I loved when they reminded us that it wasn't just about the church, but it was about outside the church. I loved when they reminded us about going to Africa. I loved when they reminded us and would have missionaries come in. In fact, in this city, we are getting ready to celebrate the home going of one of our nation's leaders as it relates to foreign missions, uh, uh, Dr. Harvey, who went home to be with the Lord, who headed the National Baptist Convention, USA Incorporated, and his funeral will be this weekend. I love talking about missions, and yet missions in the church often did not mean go ye, it meant come y'all. You know, we, we quoted go ye, but we did it with a come y'all mentality. So that it was come y'all to our church, and if you make it here, we'll do something for you. Come y'all to our program, and before you leave here, we'll do something for you. And while I loved it and while it sensitized me to the need, I recognized that if we're going to make a difference in the new millennium, we cannot have a come y'all or y'all come approach to missions. But missions truly is go ye. 
And so I want, I want to look at that piece because I see a whole lot in this text, and I just want to talk to you for a little while. Those of you uh, that know me, if you do know me, know it won't take long. Somebody say amen. amen. So Jesus gets in the boat. He said, let's go to the other side. Now, what's interesting, most of you who know these texts will know that not all of the Gospels were, were written with a sense of chronos or chronology in the sense that everything lined up the same way. And the only Gospel that really argues that he is writing it in sequential order is the Gospel of Luke. And yet all of them put this storm and this healing of this man in the same place. Now, what's interesting is when Jesus says, let's cross over to the other side, there seems to be something in the language that Jesus says when we get on the other side not only are we just crossing a lake but we're going to do something radically different we're going to get involved in something that is very very powerful we're going and I want to argue with us today that quite possibly we need to be thinking about going over to the other side doing things radically different than we've ever done it before some of the things that we try to say at Enon is we want to be a Star Trek church to boldly go where no man has gone before. And, and we want to raise the issue because we want to move from simple charity to substantive help. It's time for the church to move from just being charitable, just giving someone food or just giving someone clothes, to raising the substantive issues of how can we empower people to get their own food and wear their own clothes. And so he says, let's cross over to the other side because I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings, but in a very real sense, in many of our churches, our approach to missions has been tantamount to being the professor in Gilligan's Island. Have you ever thought about the professor in Gilligan's Island? Do you, how many of you, I saw too many young people in here, you might not even know who Gilligan is. Does anybody remember Gilligan's Island? Now, now, do you remember the professor? I have an issue with the professor. And the professor could be a model of what some of our church approach to missions have been. Would you think about the professor? Three PhDs. Brilliant. The professor had three PhDs and he was pious. Think about it. On the island for seven seasons with Ginger and Marianne and was never tempted. The Howells money never touched him. He was so brilliant, he could turn a coconut into a radio. He was so brilliant, he made huts, he made washing machines, he built golf courses. He made it wonderful to be on the island. The professor was there, and with all of his ingenuity and with all of his genius, he made being on the island a comfortable thing. And, but with all of his PhDs and all of his piety, the one thing the professor never did was took all of that to build a boat so they could get off the island. And I wonder how often the church is guilty of having ministry that makes it comfortable to stay on the island. We feed you on the island. We clothe you on the island. We stroke you on the island. We help you get over on the island. We help you shout on the island. But when will we start building some boats? Where the drug addicts get off the island, where, where mothers get off the island, where people get off the island into real living. Let's cross over to the other side. Now, now what's interesting to me is that every one of the Gospels always put this storm next to this experience with this man. Because as they get out onto the storm, and I wish I had time to unpack it, but they get out and this storm seems to come up as a foreboding presence, keeping them from getting there, or at least attempting to keep them from getting there. I wonder, are the writers of the gospel trying to remind us that when you move from simple charity to substantive help, that you're going to face some storm? Now I'm not talking about the man on, uh, in the Gadarenes. I'm talking about those who are on their way to help them. Some of us need to remember that there is a spiritual storm you will face when you really get serious about helping other people. Because if, if I had my Pentecostal hat on in here tonight, I would remind you that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. 
that there is a there is a wickedness behind what is happening to our people there is a reality that there is spiritual wickedness and evil in high places and satan likes how the world is running right now and those of us who will get serious about trying to set the captives free will run into some storms but not only spiritual storms there are other storms that come up when you get serious about helping people financial storms social storms you know i read an interesting article in the in the wall street journal yesterday it blew my mind in the wall street journal there was a, a, an article about the privatization of prisons first of all why in the world would this be in the wall street journal because this one particular prison had the, the stocks were growth stocks you know the difference between a value stock and a growth stock. This prison had grown, the stock in the privatization of this prison had grown by 45%. 45% over six months, the stocks had gone up. Why did the stocks go up? Homeland Security, when they decided to change the rules around how they would detain those illegals who, or what we call illegals, and, and detain them, that caused the prisons to fill up. Oh, I wish I had time for this. And so that somebody is getting rich. Because somebody else's demise. We who do our work in chocolate cities understand how the vanilla suburbs and rural areas are getting rich by the continued victimization and the continued use of our young boys to inform the prison industrial complex. And when you start doing ministry that gets boys off of things that put them in jail, you are taking money from somebody and somebody doesn't like it when you take their money there will be storms. Oh, I wish I had time for this. I, I don't mean to be offensive, but since you asked me to come, I think I'll tell you what I think. When we get serious about helping people, storms will come up. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Jesus it does the coolest thing that i ever ever seen in my life. He just, he stood up, he spoke up, and the winds and waves shut up. And in a very real sense, no matter how much we have to do, we have to remember that if we're going to be empowered to help people, we need the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't ever forget to worship God before you hit the streets. Don't ever forget to be in touch with God before we try, because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and wickedness and evil in high places. You've got to be prayed up if you're going to help young men and the violence in Philadelphia. You've got to be prayed up if you're going to change the tide. You've got to be prayed up if we're going to make a difference. So they get off this boat and here, I guess this is what I want to talk about because they encounter this man. And when they encounter this man, Jesus says something that blows my mind. He looks at the man and says, what's your name? But Jesus understands the difference between people and their problems. Jesus does not ask the man his name. He asks the demon his name. Jesus says, I, I see you, but I don't want to confuse you with what you do. I don't want to call you what you're in because you're not what you do. Oh, I wish I had time for this. You know, you never will help people if you only see them as what they do. You never will have compassion if you can't see the difference between the person and their problem. Because we are not our problem. Oh, I wish I had time for this. The people that you see there but for the grace of God go any one of us any here. And I'm so glad that God doesn't know me by my past or by my problem. But God knows me. For Is there anybody in here? Can we take our halos off? Is there anybody in here that is not what you used to be? You are not where you used to be because somebody could look past your faults and see your... No, I'm sorry, I, I usually holler. Is that all right? I, I'm, getting, I'm getting ahead of myself. I, I, li I like to holler. Uh, you, you, you know what happens? You know, 
earlier today, earlier today, I was, I was in Washington, D.C. I was in congressional hearings. We work a lot uh, with rescuing women and children from the throes and the traps of sexual exploitation, of the commercial sexual uh, exploitation industry. And, and one, of the, one of the interesting things is when it comes to prostitutes, why do we call them what they do when what they do is what's being done to them? What? If she's being prostituted, why do you call her the prostitute? If somebody beat you up tonight, they wouldn't call you assault. Oh, I wish I had time for that. Because even if we want to assume that the choice was made, that I want to do this, that's really not a healthy choice that comes from a healthy person. Choices for prostitution and dancing and, and all of those things usually have been made for them a lot longer before they make the choice in that moment. The hurt people hurt people. And why do we tend to look at people at, as what they do as opposed to the issues that they deal with? I am so glad that we have a God that can look past and see our personhood and not our problem. I wish I had somebody. And Jesus says, what is your name? He says, Legion, I'm messed up. There's a lot in me. And I think we have to sit there, we have to sit there for a while because I think one of the issues that impacts the mission of the church is that not all of us are compelled to deal with the same things. And we may spend too much time arguing with each other about what things we need to deal with. He said, there's a lot wrong with me. And there was a lot wrong with him. I mean, he's hanging out, he's naked, he's destroying himself, he's hanging on the tombs, he's hollering. There are many things going on with him. And certainly Jesus was and is the answer. But there were a number of things going on with this man. And there are a number of things going on in our community. And maybe it's time for the church to not tee off on itself about what is the number one priority. But all of us, out of the authenticity of who we are and what we are compelled to deal with, begin to deal with what calls us. Because if you follow your passion, and if I follow my passion, then we're going to begin to heal what ails our society. Now, my passion may not be your passion, but if we're both talking about the kingdom and helping this brother you grab him on the right and I'll grab him on the left and let's lift him together for at the end of the day there's a whole lot wrong in this society we just don't have time to argue about it so so Jesus so Jesus and I love this text Jesus deals with this demon and sends them into the swine you know I've got brothers that always run to this text and say that's why I don't eat pork because don't you see it in the text? Jesus put the demon in the swine. I said, well, follow your thought. He put the demon in the swine, and the swine ran in the water. Don't you drink? <laughs> I mean, follow your logic. Well, anyhow. <laughs> anyhow, he, he sets this man free. And we know that Jesus will set people free. But I think that we can't have such a simple and sophomoric approach to understand that as simply getting people to an altar. I'm a part of this neo-Pentecostalism. I'm one of those mega church pastors. I'm one of those who is informed by charismatic, I believe, in the gifts and the flow of the Spirit. But one of the problems that the contemporary church could have is that we think that it's all solved because they fell out and frothed at the mouth. But there's more than just falling out and frothing at the mouth at an altar that the people need. And we've got to get involved in their lives, which means a radical redistribution of wealth and resources to empower them. That after they stand up and after they have finished frothing at the mouth, they have something to live on. Can I stay there for a minute? You know, one of, one of the things that I'm challenged by when we think about all this prosperity talk that we have in the church, and, and I'm not here to argue with that, but I think that in, in many cases, what we have on television and what we show in the large church may be, may be skewed. I, I believe God will bless you. I believe God can take care of you. But I'm not so sure that God blesses us and takes care of us for us to have abundance. I'm not so sure that God blesses us and takes care of us for us to heap it up on ourselves. 
I am clear that the Bible does say, Give and it shall be given, pressed down, shaken together, shall men give unto your bosom. But I'm wondering, is there another part to the Bible that reminds us after it comes your way, what you're supposed to do with it? Can, can I make this thing plain? Let me see if I can help you with it, because my father helped me understand this thing. When my oldest brother died in 1987, my father had to rewrite his will. He had to rewrite his will because he was making sure that when he died, his children would be taken care of. Well, in 1987, I had another older brother who was strung out on drugs. He was still messed up. He was still hurting. And then my father wrote the will. And if you were to read the will, it sounded as if everything my father had was coming to me when he died. If you read the will, it sounded as if I get a lot of stuff. But that's only a surface reading of his will. Because at the time, my brother was messed up. And so the way my father wrote the will was that, yes, a whole lot of stuff seemed to be coming my way. But it was coming with instructions. And the instructions were, if I'm gone, you have to look after your brother. And so some stuff may be coming to you, but it's not for you. Because once you do what you're supposed to do for your bro, oh, I wish I had somebody in here. Maybe it's true that if you tithe, God will make covenant with you. Maybe it's true that when you give, he gives back to you. Maybe it is true that God wants to bless you and have your barns overflowing. But maybe it's because you've got a brother in the city that needs your help. Every time God blesses you, it's not for you, but he's got somebody else in mind. And it may not be your flesh, brother. And your brother may not even look like you. But if there's somebody worse off than you, you can't keep it all to yourself. If there's somebody that doesn't have what you have, you can't keep it all to yourself. And the, the good news is, whatever God gives you, there's more where that came from. Whatever God does for you, there's more where that came from. So I've made up in my mind, I'm not here to stab it and grab it and yoke it and choke it and name it and claim it. I'm here to find somebody else I'm here to say like Jabez increase my territory give me another opportunity to help somebody show me somebody that needs some help let me see if I can make this play I, got, I know I'm hollering too much let me get out of your way because this is what blows my mind after the man is healed he said Jesus let me go with you I'm ready to go I'm ready to start a ministry I'm ready to go do whatever you want. I'm ready to go run revival. I'm ready to go wherever you want me to go. Let me just hang out with you. You fix my life. Jesus said, no. Go home. Oh, I wish you could hear this. He said, man, now that you're on your feet, now that you've got your life together, the greatest thing you can do for me is not run a revival. It's go home. The greatest thing that you can do for me is not run all over the place trying to do everything, but the greatest thing that you can do for the kingdom right now is go home. I wish I could hear somebody help me in here because I think we need to understand that at the end of everything we do, we ought to be healing families. At the end of everything we do, we ought to be sending people back home because when a man goes home, when a woman goes home, when a boy comes home, when the family is strengthened, then the block is strengthened. And when the block is strengthened, then the neighborhood is strengthened. And when the neighborhood is strengthened, then the city is strengthened. And when the city is strengthened, then the state is strengthened. And when the state is strengthened, then the country is strengthened. And when the country is strengthened, then the world can get better. I know I sound idealistic, but I just believe that if we preach the the gospel if we do the gospel then the kingdoms of this world can become the kingdoms of our Lord so I stopped by to tell somebody tonight go home go home and do your thing go home and love your family go home and love your wife go home and love your kids go home and love your neighbor and when you get home tell them what the Lord did for you tell them on Christ the solid rock I stand I'm going home 